Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first of our series, uh, Goodwill Project Live. Uh, it's um, a relatively boring panel today. It's me, I'm the founder of Good Law Project, uh, and Gemma Abbott, who is our legal director. As I say, this is the first in a series of events um, that we want to do over the coming weeks and months. Indeed, we hope it will be ongoing forever. Um, and it's come out of this really, um, with your help, we've built quite an extraordinary machine. We're taking something like 20 judicial reviews against government and we're working on, uh, on a whole bunch of other initiatives that you will see in the coming months as well. Um, and we have something like 30,000 people who are um, giving us money every month. Um, and so we've um, centralised quite a lot of um, power and influence. Um, and obviously, in some ways, that's terribly nice um, for those of us inside the tent. But in other ways, it's difficult because we don't want to um, be another centre of power um, that is not accountable. Um, we are not a charity, which means that we don't have charitable objects to guide us. And the money that you give us is unrestricted, by which I mean um, it doesn't come with strings attached as to how we use it. And so um, we feel a really compelling need to find ways in which we can make ourselves accountable um, to you. Uh, and uh, this is one of those ways. I and mean, we published a couple of weeks ago a paper called How We Choose Cases. But fundamentally, these events are about us hearing from you what you want us to do and us making ourselves available to you, accountable to you, because you are, um, uh, as I put it before, um, the bow uh, that draws um, the Good Law Project arrow. Um, so the format uh, today is that we will, between us, take four uh, questions submitted in advance. Uh, and uh, we'll also invite you to submit during the course of today further questions that either Gemma or I will take um, as appropriate. So I very much encourage you to submit questions. Um, the first of those questions, really one for Gemma, is what is the biggest challenge Good Law Project currently faces in bringing cases against the government? Gemma, over to you. Thanks for the intro, Joe. I hope hopefully I'm not too boring today. <laughs> um, I was speaking to um, my brilliant legal team yesterday actually about the biggest challenge that we face when we're bringing cases against the government at the moment and we were agreed that it's very much um comes from the strategic approach that we think we see government taking um it can be very difficult to find yourself on the other side of an opponent who isn't just trying to win on the merits but actually conducts themselves in a way that makes litigation very difficult and we see that in a number of different respects so for example one very potent example, I think, is costs and our cost exposure from bringing these cases. You know, we're so lucky to be so brilliantly funded by so many people. Um, but nonetheless, there is significant cost risk that goes with bringing judicial reviews against government. And it seems that that cost risk is uh, highly amplified in cases that involve us for some reason. Um, we've seen statistics. So around 10,000 judicial reviews were granted permission between 2010 and 2019. And only 168 of those cost the government more than £100,000 in legal fees. And I will give you just a couple of brief examples of uh, recent cases that we've brought against government and, and government's legal estimated legal fees on those. So in the first instance, we have three one day one day hearings um, that deal with procurement issues around um, government's response to the pandemic. So our public first case, which involved um, an unlawful, uh, the High Court found an unlawful uh, award of a contract to some friends of Dominic Cummings, um, a one day hearing where government spent some five hundred thousand pounds in legal fees. Another one that's been uh, stayed pending resolution of government's appeal on public versus our Hanbury case, also involving 
um, a direct contract award to some friends of Dominic Cummings, £450,000 estimated on legal costs on that. Um, our unpublished contracts case that we were successful on back in February, um, over £200,000 spent on costs. And in our... Um, our PPE cases, which was, to be fair, a, a, a long um, involved four day hearing, government's uh, estimated costs were one million pounds. So you can see just a massively disproportionate costs um, exposure on cases. It seems to be involving involving us and involving us only. And I, I couldn't possibly speculate as to why that is, but it does feel often that it's a tactic that's being deployed to try to bully us or to try to discourage us from bringing more more litigation. Um, we can also see just in the way that government approaches our cases in particular that sometimes it really does feel like they're not doing it in good faith. Um, when you bring judicial review cases, government has a responsibility to put its cards face up on the table. It has to comply with its so-called duty of candor. And we've seen really to be honest, egregious examples of it failing to do so. So I, I mentioned those PPE cases earlier where we challenged um, government's direct award of contracts worth millions to um, three quite unlikely uh, contractors, Pestfix, Clandeboy and Ianda. And in that, we saw a really remarkable uh, lack of clarity or candor when it came to engaging with us in the first instance. So government had provided us with a response to our pre action protocol letter. It had provided us with its um, summary grounds of resistance after we issued judicial review proceedings. And somehow it found itself having not disclosed to us at any point in those pages and pages of correspondence that a VIP lane existed at all, which, which turned out to be one of you know, the really core parts of our case. Um, and just yesterday, in fact, we have um, we got the good news that the ICO have agreed with us that government's lack of candor or transparency in relation to VIP contracts is, is totally unacceptable. And, and they've been ordered to release all 47 names of VIPs who went through that VIP lane. But, but, but for our litigation, it's not clear that anybody would have ever found out about it in that first instance. So really quite frustrating. Um, and, and we've also seen you know, ongoing issues with disclosure. So every time we try to engage with government, we find that we are you know, having to engage in multiple rounds of correspondence, often finding ourselves in court to get government to provide what, what we need. On our Abingdon cases, we've had four interim hearings with the judge getting increasingly frustrated the number of times we're appearing before him, be simply because government just will not will not provide to us what what it what it needs to provide. And and in the con that context, we've seen some really quite frustrated comments from the judge. Um, you know, he's described uh, government as providing the sort of explanation one would expect from an under resourced or litigation inexperienced firm. It is just not good enough, I'm afraid or he's described them as having an exceptionally dilatory approach being taken to necessary steps. So we've seen seen some really frustrating behavior. Um, what I would say is that it's a challenge, but it's not discouraging us. So we're still um, very much up for bringing these um, these cases, as you can see, as Bruce says, we've got around 20 on the books at the moment and, and we won't be dissuaded and we won't be bullied out of bringing them, but, but it can be difficult. Thank you, Gemma. Um, uh, a not at all boring answer. Um, uh, the next pre-submitted question is, do we need a written constitution given that the conventions, checks and balances uh, that used to protect us are rapidly being eroded? Um, so the sort of um, TLDR of uh, British constitutional theory is um, uh, the good chap. So the idea is that um, there will always be um, good people in government who will do the right thing because they are good people. And in those circumstances, you don't need a harder edged um, constitution. And depending on which um, constituency in the country where they sit in the sort of socio-economic hierarchy. Um, uh, you would hear different accounts of the extent to which that um, good chap has served the interests of the nation in decades up until 
this one, I think you'd probably have to go quite some way to find somebody who told you that the good chap theory of our constitution continues to serve us. Um, uh, everything has changed um, since the, the referendum. Um, you know, the prorogation of parliament was a democratic outrage. A man elected by the majority of members of the Conservative Party. So, you know, 60,000 people um, chose to suspend the only uh, United Kingdom-wide democratically enfranchised body that we have, Parliament. And even yesterday, uh, members of his cabinet are still complaining that the Supreme Court said, no, we do continue to live in a democracy. Um, so I think that um, the present constitutional arrangements, I don't, I smile when I say that because I think to call them constitutional arrangements really is to lend them a dignity that they don't actually um, deserve. They are um, the institutionalization of complacency, of national complacency. Um, the present constitutional arrangements are plainly inadequate. Um, do we need a written constitution? Um, I, I'm not sure that's the right question, actually, um, because at the moment there is no will to implement one. And so the question whether it would be nice to have one is a bit like the question whether it would be nice to win um, the lottery. Um, it's kind of uh, one for daydreaming about um, when the sport gets boring on the telly, but not really one, I think, for serious consideration at the moment. Certainly, um, we at Good Law Project have some uh, ideas. Um, we will be looking to put those ideas on the political agenda. Um, we are already speaking to leading constitutional lawyers um, in the United Kingdom about what shape a written constitution might take. Um, and we will be asking opposition parties in due course to consider whether it might form part of their um, manifestos. Uh, you know, uh, horrible image, forgive me. Daydreaming in, 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 in front of the telly. Um, yes, uh, I do think a written constitution would be hugely helpful. Not a silver bullet, um, but hugely helpful. Uh, the real question is, um, uh, what's the route from here to there? Um, that at least is, is, is my own view. Um, Gemma, the third question. Yeah, thank you. So somebody wanted to ask, how do we prioritise what to take action against? Um, there's obviously no shortage <laughs> of possibilities for us uh, looking at the political landscape today. Um, and we do have finite resources, so it can be actually extremely difficult to prioritise what, what we do. Um, so our mission is that we use the law for a better world. We bring cases that we hope will have a widespread impact. We only bring cases that have legal merit. Uh, that's really important, albeit that um, how much legal merit it has will depend on the other important sort of factors that we're bringing to bear on the decision. But it was a depressing truth for me to realize, actually, somebody who thought that seeking legal accountability for legal wrongdoing was, a, was an end in itself. Um, actually, the law is a powerful tool, but it, it, it can't exist in isolation. And I think litigation can't bring results in isolation either. And so we do have other criteria that we look at when we're making decisions about cases. And actually, we recently... Joe alluded to this at the start. We recently published a blog. You can still find it in the news section on our website um, that I think is entitled, How Do We Choose Our Cases? So uh, a, good, a good response to this question, in fact. But it sets out in there um, five criteria that we will have regard to. And, and what we say is that um, cases we bring will need to meet at least one 
of, of these of these objects. So um, they are that there is an actual or um, latent political or public interest in the issue itself. Um, it'll address an issue that it's an issue addressing an issue that affects um, a discriminated or disadvantaged group of people. Um, it will help us to speak to a new audience or to work in a new way, or that it addresses an issue that's unlikely to be litigated otherwise. And, and that, that actually comes up quite often because we will see issues that we feel very strongly about that we think somebody needs to do something about that. But brilliantly, somebody is already doing something about that. And, and, and it's really important that we're using our resources to um, do things that nobody else is going to do or to do them better because otherwise we're not making the, the best of, of the resources that you all the public so kindly provide to us. Um, we also, of course, look at the, our portfolio of litigation as a whole. And we need to have a balance, um, you know, between the different um, types of litigation that we're bringing. We have three sort of main strands of work that we do. Uh, we um, have a work stream called Upholding Democracy, sort of seeking account accountability. Uh, we have one called No One Left Behind, where we try to uh, do our best to tackle issues of injustice or inequality. And we have an environmental work stream as well. And, and the goal isn't to get a, a perfectly even balance between them, but it is to try to find the right balance between them. And also to ensure that we're not only being reactive, because it is actually very easy to spot um, as I say, cases that come up in particular in the upholding democracy work stream, there are constant affronts to our democracy going on on an almost daily basis, but we can't respond to everything and give ourselves the space and the time to build proactive cases that will really have a broad impact. So that's really important to us as well. Joe, did you have anything to add to that question? Uh, no, I think that was a very good answer. <laughs> um, fourth question uh, pre-submitted. Uh, encourage you again to send in further questions that you'd like us to answer. Um, Gemma and I have agreed that um, all the hostile ones I will take uh, and all of the nice ones Gemma will take. <laughs> um, for my sins, I used to be a tax lawyer and um, you'd expect um, to get beaten up by judges. Uh, and in a, in a uh, not that I went to public school, but in an almost public school way, I, 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 I learned to, to, to relish them. Um, uh, the fourth question, what is the government doing to reclaim money paid for unusable PPE? Is this being pursued? And if not, why were these questions not signed, uh, contracts not signed on a fit for purpose basis? Um, we don't really know is the short answer. Um, in a written answer given a couple of weeks ago, uh, Lord Bethel, um, remember him, uh, offered that... £2.8 billion, pounds, I think, was the number um, of PPE. That's a bit more than 20% of all that we bought had already been identified as not being um, usable in the NHS. Um, I suspect, actually, that's quite a significant underestimate because there are fields and fields and fields of shipping containers full of PPE that I can't imagine has been examined. So um, it's likely that when those shipping containers are opened up, um, there will be a mix um, of that which is past its shelf life um, and a mix of uh, that which um, just isn't fit for purpose um, and a mix uh, of that um, which is usable. Um, we bought five years, remarkably, we bought five years of supply at five times the normal price, spending in total um, £12.5 billion pounds on PPE. Uh, and an awful lot of it will be unusable. Um, but worse than that, really, um, if we had bought one year's supply at those sort of pandemic prices, it would have cost us two and a half billion pounds. Um, and if we had then bought years two, three, four, and five at the normal prices that PPE now sells for, it would have cost us a further two billion pounds. So what we spent 12 and a half billion pounds on buying in a hurry, much of it sitting in fields in 
um, shipping containers. We could have bought for four and a half billion pounds and we probably would have got better product as well because we wouldn't have been buying in a frantic hurry. Um, is any of this money going to be recovered? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I can't say with confidence that it will be because um, if you're spending um, 250, 350 million pounds buying from um, Crisp Websites Limited with net assets of 18,000 um, pounds and it spends money on dud um, PPE, and we know that it did, vast sums on dud PPE, um, that money just isn't available to be recouped. Um, it can't be uh, recovered from the Chinese manufacturer because government doesn't have a relationship with them. Um, and perhaps um, some of the profits that will have been made by um, Crisp Websites Limited uh, 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 may still sit in the company, but it's much more likely that it's been distributed uh, as dividends or salary to directors. So I just, I, I can't really see um, how that money can be recovered. And again, it, it really illustrates why it was just so bizarre um, that government chose to contract with VIPs, uh, Pestfix was a VIP, um, who had no assets, so they could supply unusable PPE and did, um, and the taxpayer have no recourse. It's really quite depressing, and in some cases, really quite um, uh, perplexing. Perplexing is one of those words that lawyers use as a kind of code. We don't really mean perplexing. Um, we mean alarming. Um, so, uh, next um, question that's been submitted, Gemma, might be one for you. Yeah, well, we've done our pre-submitted questions, so we're now going to have the excitement of them popping up on the screen and us not knowing what they're going to be, and then having to decide quickly whether I, I will answer them or you will. Um, but as you've already said, you've very kindly fallen on your sword and agreed to answer the awkward ones. So I'm going to take the non-awkward ones, and in fact, I'm going to take this first one, I think. Um, but I understand we're, it's, it's a chat, Joe. We can have a dialogue. We can talk about the answers together. So everyone, we're supposed to pretend that there's nobody listening. Um but not swear at the same time. So there's, there's a balance to be found there. So does Good Law Project intend to do more environmental uh, climate breakdown cases? Um, there's a pretty straightforward, quick answer to this question, which is yes, very much so. Um, the environment is one of our work streams. Um, we have uh, brilliant people working internally who are committed specifically actually just spending quite a lot of their time doing environmental work and it's something that we all feel very strongly about I think it, it, you know the defining crisis of our time to be frank um, but it's not actually a very easy area for us to work in sometimes um, there are lots of other excellent uh, not-for-profit organizations or charities doing strategic litigation in this space in a way that actually we don't really see as much in, in the other work streams that we do necessarily. Um, and as I already said, it's really important that we are adding value or bringing something different to the table that we're not just doing work that somebody else could do. Um, and those organizations that specialize in environment, environmental litigation, I think, do sometimes bring something that we wouldn't bring to bear necessarily um, on these cases. But I think that there is there are real opportunities for us to do work here that other people won't do or, or, or don't wish to do that, that can be tremendously impactful. And um, one of the ways that we're looking at that at the moment is thinking about whether there are means for us to empower communities or empower uh, smaller groups to bring their own litigation in this space to tackle issues that relating to the climate the environment that are happening up and down the country but that are just quite difficult to access legally for some people um often because they're because they're not lawyers or because of funding restriction you know problems or whatever the reason is they can't necessarily see the way in but actually when you step back and look at the country as a whole you can see them replicating across different areas so that is very much something that we're looking into at the moment um, we're also really interested in um, trying to tackle issues 
um, around pollution in our rivers, which again is just a, a massive, a massive crisis in in the country at the moment. Um, not an easy one from a from a legal perspective, but one that we're really committed to cracking. Joe, was there anything that you wanted to add to that one? Yeah, I guess um, because of those freedoms that I identified um, when I was introducing this, um, we have space to do things that other people can't do. And where other people can't act, um, my experience is that there are outsized opportunities for us to have impacts. Um, and I suppose part of the process of choosing how we allocate our resources is to go to places that other people can't go to uh, and to act in those places. Um, and uh, that is something we will certainly try to do in the environmental law space. There is no value in us replicating in a um, not especially um, useful way work that bigger, more, um, better resourced, more sophisticated operators in, in, in pure environmental law. Um, people like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth can do better. I mean, you know, uh, we'll just bugger things up. There is no value to that. Um, so what are the opportunities for us? Um, next question, um, really one for me. Um, how is Good Law Project viewed by the rest of the legal profession and its hierarchy? Is it largely supportive? Um I mean, the answer is kind of what you'd expect. Um, it's nuanced. Um, if you ask uh, judges, you'll get a different answer to what you'll get if you ask regulators, and you'll get a different answer if you ask barristers, and then you'll get a different answer if you ask um, lawyers on, on, on Twitter, um, a forum that obviously I enjoy, but which doesn't always bring out um, nuance with great uh, success. Um, just sort of reflecting on all of that, um, for me, it's been really cheering, actually, that um, judges recognise the value in what we do um, and have responded um, receptively to our interventions. That's been um, kind of a surprise to me, actually. I think in my head, growing up, judges were sort of um, very conservative creatures, very often socially conservative um, and constitutionally conservative in sort of both senses of that word constitutionally. Um, and so it's been kind of a surprise um, to me that they have created space for us to act in the way in which I do. And I've reflected on that. And actually, I, I think um, the conservatism um, that bugged me when I thought society was conservative and I wanted to be radical is actually helpful in a world in which um, we are pursuing kind of bread and butter, um, um, mainstream legal actions in a world in which um, the government is incredibly uh, radical, um, albeit I would say not radical in a good way. Um, and so that inherent conservatism of the judiciary has actually been helpful to us. Um, regulators, I think um, we have a lot of support. I mean, I I really, really, really value the work that um, my regulator does. Um, there are a lot of bad lawyers in the world, like there are a lot of bad um, professionals of every um, type. And those professionals can cause enormous harm to members of the public. And I want our regulators to be able to go after, um, in my profession, bad lawyers um, vigorously. 
uh, and where doing the very novel work that I do, we haven't really at Good Law Project been able to find an analog for how we operate in the UK or indeed anywhere else in the world. Um, so we're, we're sort of, <laughs> we're entering there be dragons space um, for regulators. They've never really thought about it. I suppose for me, I try to ask myself the question, well, um, this thing that I'm about to do, um, that I'm contemplating doing, um, what would the Bar Standards Board, my regulator, um, say if it was done by um, a barrister who was in the cabinet, who is also wearing two hats? Um, but it's difficult, right? I don't put QC in my um, public uh, political pronouncements um, because I don't think it's appropriate for me to um, have the benefit uh, of that legal title. But I put in barrister because I don't think it's honest to pretend or to disguise the fact that I'm a lawyer. Um, but even that explanation isn't terribly satisfactory and tells you something about how difficult you find it. Um, lawyers, well, um, uh, an awful lot of um, reaction to the work that we do is driven by uh, or, or, an awful lot of the legal reaction um, from lawyers on social media to the work that we do is a function of whether they like our politics or not. And um, if they don't like our politics, um, they find us ethically outrageous. And if they do like our politics, they would overlook um, ethical outrages if there were any. Um, I don't think there are. We try very hard um, to get stuff right um, without much help from the regulator. Um, uh, but I think that's the right way to answer that question. People um, who are very, very angry with us in the legal profession very often are angry with us because they don't like our politics rather than because of anything that we are doing wrong. Um, as lawyers. Um, I hope that's that's helpful. I've been broadly cheered by the reaction of a profession um, that is conservative. Uh, I think Lord Atkin described judges once as um, elderly white men who have lived on the whole unadventurous lives. Um, uh, I've been cheered by the reaction of the profession to the work that Good Law Project does. Yeah. Could I just add as well, I mean, I am not a public figure, so I don't think, as far as I can tell, I'm polarising in any way because I don't think I'm I'm regarded. <laughs> I don't think people think about it. Um, and I, and my, so I think my experience is quite different in terms of my exposure to the legal profession and the work we do. And actually, I, whilst I don't agree, I don't think people would overlook any ethical wrongdoing because of their partisanship. Luckily, I don't think they have to. Um, but I do find that people are on the whole very supportive. And actually, I think what you said about, in some ways, it's the government who are radical at the moment. And what we're pursuing is actually quite a conservative with a small C agenda, right? We're trying to uphold the rule of law or do things properly. You know, there's a really strong sense for me of fair play. And actually, that is something I think that resonates with a lot of the legal profession. I think you, if you asked your average solicitor on the street, that might well be one of the reasons why they went into it in the first place. And there are things that government is doing today that are a real affront to their sense of fair play and their sense of what's right and appropriate. Um, and I think that they're grateful that we put our heads above the parapet to try to deal with it because the number of private messages I get on LinkedIn saying, oh, I really support you with this, but there's no way I could share it on my on my work page without <laughs> getting into trouble. That, you know, there's about five a week. Um, but I think I think largely people are supporting. Um, so what is the next question? I'm going to see it when it pops up. Um, so somebody is asking, what about challenging injustices done to minority or marginalized communities such as boat dwellers, travelers, and so on? Um, shall I take this? It's, it's a really important part of our No One Left Behind work stream, actually, that we are are doing as much as we can to challenge injustices done to marginalized communities like the Gypsy Roman traveler communities, in fact. And we've been working recently 
um, with a, a not-for-profit organization in that space, the Traveler Movement, to try to tackle some issues of racist bullying. We're also working with a, um, a family from the Gypsy Roman Traveler communities who um, have experienced a terrible loss as a consequence of, of racist bullying. Um, it's a space that I always want to approach with the, like the right amount of humility and, and, and acknowledgement that it's not, I don't have experience of being a gypsy or, or, or traveler person. I'm not, I'm not from the, any of those communities. And so I really see our role as amplifying, providing a platform, supporting um, allyship. But I, I do think that we have, we have resources to bring. We have, um, expertise in terms of litigation that you know that we can offer to support communities who are experiencing you know real wrongs and and we're do and we are um, prioritizing actually our relationships with the Gypsy Roman traveler communities also with other um, communities that we regard they're not homogenous communities by any stretch of the imagination but groups that we can see as as highly marginalized or disadvantaged um, namely um, the tr issues with trans rights we are um, extremely active on and we're also doing a lot of work um, to support uh, care experienced people and children in care at the moment um, that we're not we haven't sort of closed the doors on any on other cases that we will bring under that work stream but actually those are three um, sort of areas where we are really committed as an organization to, do, to doing more um, and we're working on that you know as we speak on an ongoing basis I hope that yeah. answers it Jim um, let me just add a couple of points to that. Um, good allyship is difficult. It's really difficult. Um, as Gemma says, you can't speak with the authenticity of a community. It's dangerous for you to speak for them. Um, they don't want your moral or ethical um, or even financial largesse. Um, they want to be treated as equal, um, and so they should be. Um, but there is another side to it as well, um, which is that um, if I am... Um, working with a uh, black trans woman, I will be heard in places um, and in ways uh, different from how she will be heard. People who will not listen to her, sometimes for reasons that are entirely um, subconscious and to which no blame attaches um, may listen to me and I'm not I don't feel comfortable with ducking um, the responsibilities that come with having a voice that um, can create space for others I mean privately um, the thing that gives me the most satisfaction about the work that I do is when people tell me that um, through speaking out on an issue, um, I have created space for them to say things that are important to them. I always find that a really moving um, compliment, really. It feels to me like a, a really powerful and important use of um, a status that I that I have. Um, we also the other point I wanted to make is we also think we're starting to think about um, how we can justify just acting for one or two or three disadvantaged, particularly disadvantaged communities, and how long we can hypothecate resource to those issues where there are other um, pressing areas of disadvantage as well. So um, I tweeted about trans rights the other day and somebody said, well, what are you doing for um, my community, which is people who are disabled? And the 
answer is um, we haven't sufficiently focused on it, right? We haven't done enough. Um, and I can imagine similar challenges from other um, groups as well. I mean, since then, as it happens, we've done this work for, for vulnerable families in, in schools, so we don't do nothing, but we could do more and we want to do more. And so we're starting to think about not merely how we pick work streams up, but also how we put them down in ways that enable those work streams to continue, work streams that we think are really, really important, but that allow us to shift our gaze, um, to shift our focus, to shift our resources, our potential impact um, to other areas of need as well. And I think um, where we're likely to land is that it means that we form relationships with grassroots organizations who can speak for those communities. Um, we work with them in ways that cause those communities to prosper and grow and be able to bring uh, the litigation themselves that protects those communities with from us whatever support they need um, whilst we turn our attention um, to other areas of, of, of need. Um, it's really difficult stuff. You never want to say to any, I never want to say to anybody, no, we can't do that incredibly important thing. Um, I don't want to have to answer the impossible question, well, why not? You're doing it for other people. Um, but, you know, there are no perfect answers to any of this. Um, we try to be thoughtful in, the, in our approach to it. Thanks, Joe. Um, we had one more question. I think we're running out of time a bit, but perhaps we you can answer this one. I'll give you a minute. How do, do you think that can be done? Okay. How receptive have the media been in the sharing of your legal actions and interventions? Um, one of the paradoxes of Good Law Project success is that government has made it happen. Um, if government paid, I hope there's no no one from government on this this call. I don't want to give away is. the secrets to how to kill a good law project. But the secret of how to kill a good law project is um, <laughs> adhere to the law, <laughs> adhere to the law around freedom of information. Because one of the reasons we've succeeded is because the media has been really keen to work with us. Because through litigation, we get access to stuff that they can't get access to through making FOI requests. Well, if government adhered to the law, if it was not um, allergic to transparency, if it was not um, uh, to the government as sunlight is to a vampire, um, there would be much less demand on the part of media organisations to work with us um, and we would wither and die deprived of the sunlight of publicity. Um, but as I say, I hope no one from government's listening. Um, I think an urging for them to stop doing unlawful things, you know, uh, that they, they could stop doing unlawful things and we would all go home, right? I, <laughs> um, but, yeah, you can I have a very nice rocking chair. I, I can imagine <laughs> spending some happy time in. <laughs> exactly. Um, thanks so much, Joe. So I'm going to just wrap up now. We've just got a minute or so left. Um, it's been a real pleasure. So thank you. Um and thanks to everybody listening today and, and for supporting us because we literally couldn't do it without you. It, it sounds a bit cheesy to say it sometimes, but it's the absolute truth um, on this occasion. We are lucky enough to be supported by thousands of people um, on a monthly basis and we and we literally couldn't do it without you. Um, we've had lots of questions from people asking how they can support us in different ways and, and we are obviously always grateful for financial support but actually there are other ways to help us as well to the way I think the way that we will have most impact is for more people to know what we're doing. It's as simple as that. So the more people we can reach, the more impact we will have. So if you are already here, you already know who we are and you already hopefully support us, some of you, uh, most of you I'll hope. Um, but actually, if you're not already on our mailing list, please do sign up. You can see the sign up 
link um, on the scrolling banner. I feel very professional saying that. Um, and also, what I would really implore you to do is to talk about us to your friends. So forward our emails, share, you know, sharing on social media is brilliant as well, although I think, you know, we have good reach on social media. But actually, if you have five friends who haven't heard of us before, why don't you send us, send them one of our emails, send us our, the, our sign up link and let them know about, about Good Law Project as well. And that really is tremendously helpful. Um, and obviously your continued support on specific campaigns that you care about is massively appreciated as well, whether that's signing our petitions, um, writing to people to complain about them, sharing our articles on um, on social media, all of that and, and our crowd justice um, pages supporting them as well, of course, is hugely appreciated. But thank you. Thank you all. Um, and we'll see you again next week with a hopefully a much more exciting uh, and interesting panel. Than <laughs> <me>. <laughs> thank you.